Now, your forecast first. Hey, good evening, everybody. I'm meteorologist Craig Flint. Uh, we've had a few light rain showers through the evening, but those are in the process uh, of dwindling. You can see them moving through right there. Just a few blips left over. Uh, and look at the clearing to the west here. So uh, as we go through the overnight hours, that will be working in. Uh, I expect the sky to gradually clear out and it will turn less humid by the time you wake up tomorrow morning. The complete forecast coming up. Eyewitness News first at 10 on Fox. Starts right now. Local news that matters. This is Eyewitness News first at 10. Tonight first at 10, Barrick Street turned pedestrian only over the weekend. Hear from local businesses on how they thought it went. And the Girl Scouts of New York Penn received a grant to help provide resources for scouts in need. We'll bring you the details. Plus, a bill that could change surcharges on speeding tickets in New York State. How that affects you. Good evening and thank you for joining us tonight for Eyewitness News. First at 10, I'm Shelby Pay. Last weekend, Varick Street, home to many of Utica's favorite bars and restaurants, was closed to vehicle traffic between the hours of 8 p.m. and 3 a.m. on Friday and Saturday. Eyewitness News has been following this story and went back to Varick Street today to gauge the reaction from businesses to the street closure. Last weekend, Varick Street, home to many of Utica's favorite bars and restaurants, was closed to vehicle traffic between the hours of 8 p.m. and 3 a.m. on Friday and Saturday. Eyewitness News has been following this story and went back to Barrick Street today to gauge the reaction from businesses to the street closure. None of the businesses that we spoke to today were willing to talk to us on the record, but several managers of Barrick Street establishments were not thrilled with the trial or its rollout. Two separate businesses stated that their Friday and Saturday lunch and dinner service had been impacted by the road closure and that the signage that had been posted notifying the public of the temporary parking ban did not state specific times the ban would be in effect. One of the managers we spoke to also indicated that they were concerned about customers with temporary or permanent physical disabilities being able to reach the restaurant when convenient street-side parking was banned. A third business said that, Although they did not feel their business had been impacted, drivers making deliveries to their restaurant had been confused by the unclear signage and had parked their delivery vehicles further away from the restaurant than was necessary because they were concerned about getting ticketed while making their deliveries. Eyewitness News also contacted the mayor's office to clarify whether the trial would be extended for a second weekend and whether the issues with unclear signage would be fixed. The mayor was unable to speak with us today regarding Barrick Street and has yet to decide whether the trial will be extended. Reporting from Utica, Josh Riley, Eyewitness News, first at 10. Points, fines, and surcharges, all the penalties you could face for a speeding ticket, and those fees can add up quickly. But where does that money go? Our Capitol correspondent, Emil Taligi, has those answers and the latest on a bill that would cap surcharges. Right now, New York automatically imposes a surcharge of $88 or $93, depending on whether the driver was in a city or a town. This is in addition to the fine for the speeding ticket. It could be a $45 speeding ticket. It ends up costing, in some cases, two or $300 because of the surcharges. That seems to me like it's a system that's more focused on revenue generation rather than fairness and appropriateness. Assemblymember Angela Santa Barbara has introduced a bill that would cap surcharges to a maximum 10% of the original fine. He says right now the surcharges just don't make sense. When you think of a surcharge, you think of a percentage or a portion of what the original uh, what the original amount is, but in this case, we're seeing 100, 200, 300 percent or even higher at the end of the day. But what exactly are surcharges? Ryan McCall, attorney with Tully Rinky, explains. Typically, surcharges are somewhat done either at the town or county level. It really depends on what county you're in. Most of the time, once you get those types of tickets, right, they'll use a the surcharge to cover court fees, things like that. McCall says that money also helps pay court staff and adds to the state's general fund, often putting money into the state-run programs. When I asked McCall if he thought this bill could be a success. I'm somewhat skeptical just based on my knowledge of New York State and how I know how reliant they are on these surcharges in addition to other things to be able to pay court staff, things like that. But it wouldn't be out of the realm of possibility. I think it would be a welcome sight for a lot of traffic speeders out there. Reporting in Albany, I'm Talegi.
And good news for taxpayers, the state is capping the property tax levy growth at 2% for all municipalities that operate on a calendar fiscal year. It's the same tax levy cap the state announced back in January for all school districts. Capital correspondent Jamie DeLine explains. Since 2012, uh, the state set a limit on the amount by which school districts and local governments can increase the property tax levy. And the property tax levy is your total amount that's billed to taxpayers in the locality. That cap is once again set at 2%. Simonia Brown, Assistant Deputy Comptroller, explains the reasoning behind having a cap. The idea was to provide property tax relief to minimize or limit the burden on taxpayers. And in addition, it also provides a additional budget transparency for residents in a, a locality or in a school district who has to pay uh, taxes associated with school budgets. She says this can impact how much resources schools have for programs. In a statement, New York State United teacher said, quote, NYSA has long advocated for alternate funding strategies that empower local communities to make the best decisions for their schools without a cap placed at the state level. School districts, however, can override the cap if they get 60% voter approval. And if they decide that, well, they think their school district should be spending more. They want their students in their schools to get more programming beyond the tax cap. They have the opportunity to do that through um, a budget, through an override. Reporting in Albany, I'm Jamie DeLine. Coming up tonight on Eyewitness News at 10, the Girl Scouts of New York 10 received a grant to help provide resources for scouts in need. We'll bring you those details. And later on, we'll bring you more information regarding former President Donald Trump's legal limbo. We'll be right back. This is Eyewitness News, first at 10. Youth mental health has become an increasingly prominent issue in recent years. Our reporter Josh Riley spoke with the Vice President of Marketing and Communications at Girl Scout New York Penn to learn about a grant they have received to help provide resources for scouts in need. Everyone has to deal with mental health concerns from time to time. And in past years, this has extended to children as well as adults. Institutions that work with children have had to learn how to provide support for those in need 
and one such institution is the Girl Scouts. For the past two years, adult volunteers working with the Girl Scouts here in New York have been able to receive training in youth mental health first aid. When you hear about first aid, you probably find yourself thinking about scrapes and cuts and not counseling. Here is Jamie Alvarez, the Vice President of Marketing and Communications at Girl Scouts New York Penn, to tell us more about what Youth Mental Health First Aid is. So Youth Mental Health First Aid is designed to teach adults who regularly work with young people how to help an adolescent ages 12 to 18 um, who is experiencing a mental health uh, crisis or an addiction challenge um, and just to be able to be part of that early intervention. This training, um, it assists us with efforts to train both council staff. We have two youth mental health first aid trainers on staff, and then they in turn train our adult volunteers as they support the mental well-being of the girls in our program. So with that in mind, I asked Jamie about how this program would be affecting the Girl Scouts here in Oneida County. Oneida County is one of the counties that we serve across our council footprint here. Um, I think the impact will be very you know, positive. We have, as I said, two YM uh, HFA instructors on staff, and they're going to be delivering training to any volunteers who want to be part of that later this month. We do it virtually. And if you want to get involved and help the scouts on their mission to improve the mental health of the girls and young women in Oneida County's troops, here's what you have to do to become part of what they are doing. They have to obviously be a member of our council. They need to be an adult volunteer with Girl Scouts of Night Pen Pathways. We are always looking for trusted adult volunteers to become troop leaders and to become adult you know, members of our of our leadership program. So if you go to gsnypenn.org and click join, you can learn more about becoming adult volunteer and, and get involved. Reporting from Utica, Josh Riley, Eyewitness News, first at 10. In the aftermath of the torrential rains that hit the state in the last week, not only were roadways negatively impacted, so were railways. Many Mohawk Valley residents take the ride to Albany Rensselaer Amtrak Station to travel down to New York City. That line was shut down for a while, but Amtrak is slowly restoring service to upstate areas. James De La Fuente in Albany tells us about the timetable. Right now, riders on the Adirondack line can only travel from New York City to the Albany Rensselaer train station. But beginning Monday, that service will be extended to Schenectady and Saratoga Springs. Amtrak customers trying to visit the North Country and Montreal just can't catch a break this summer. There have been many disruptions because of weather, fires, and restrictions on Canadian tracks. Assemblyman Angelo Santa Barbara asked Amtrak to get the trains moving again. In a letter today, the assembly member thanked Amtrak for the limited resumption of service. He says... While I'm pleased to see the restoration of service to Saratoga Springs, it is essential that we work towards a prompt resolution to restore service at least to points north as far as Plattsburgh to benefit upstate New York's residents and visitors. Yet he says the resumption of service is incomplete and upstate tourism is suffering from the effects. This is part of our economy. This supports our economy. It's very critical that we have restoration of the service in the state of New York. Steve Strauss, executive director of Empire State Passengers Association, says things could take some time to fully restore the Adirondack line back to full service. There's uh, some questions about whether there's a place to turn the train around properly or to store the train on a spare track for a number of hours before it would change direction. And then lastly, there are federal regulations that uh, limit how long an individual train tr crew can operate the train without a mandated rest period. And I have reached out to Amtrak to see when full service of the Adirondack line is expected to return, and I am awaiting that response. Reporting in Saratoga Springs, James De La Fuente, News 10, ABC. Be sure to get our CNY homepage app to stay up to date on all the latest local news. Before we go to break, here's a preview of your weather with Chief Meteorologist Craig Flint. All right, Shelby, uh, good evening to you. Good evening, everybody. Uh, so we're watching the uh, smoke from the wildfires. Look at that go away. And a lot more cleaner air. Less humid air, too, in the complete forecast.
Now, your eyewitness weather forecast. All right, let's get you ready to go for midweek. And I think the weather is going to be pretty nice uh, around here. Less humidity. Smoke is clearing out. We still had a few lingering showers out there earlier. Uh, those are going away. So clearing sky, less humidity uh, coming up later tonight. Temperatures will drop into the upper 50s to near 60. See those showers just kind of fizzle out there? That's the last of it. So uh, we should go through the rest of the night rain free. And I think that's going to carry over into uh, Wednesday as well. 62 Inlet, 64 in Old Forge. Here in town in the upper 60s. Herkimer in the mid 60s to Coldbrook. Minden is at 68. Low 60s Lawrence to Springfield. Sherburn as well. And Hamilton at 64. All right. Uh, I forgot to update that, so let's just go right by that graphic. Uh, so the smoke um, is uh, in the process of clearing out. Notice all of those yellowish colors there. Uh, some of the oranges still over far northern New York State. But all of this is uh, slowly starting to work its way uh, away. So notice all the clear uh, weather off to the north and west. Uh, that's moving in. So that's what's going to be here uh, as we go into the day on Wednesday. All right, let's talk about uh, what's going on satellite and radar-wise. Again, we had a few of those showers and thunderstorms kind of perk up, flare up in the afternoon. Some of them just south of town got a little gusty with some damaging wind across far eastern Madison County into parts of northern Otsego County. Even here locally, Herkimer Road was closed for a little while for um, trees down, but last vestiges of those showers and storms moving away as we clear the sky. So there you go on uh, Futurecast, becoming partly cloudy to mainly clear, uh, turning cooler and less humid by the time you wake up. We're somewhere in the upper 50s. Tomorrow is probably one of the best days we will have this summer. Sunshine, temperatures right around 80, low humidity. That's going to change again by Thursday as it becomes warmer and more humid. And I think most of Thursday is mainly dry, but we get towards the evening. So 6, 7, 8 o'clock, probably be a few showers and thunderstorms developing by then. And those are going to spill over into Friday, but it's not all day on Friday. So right around 80-ish tomorrow. Fresh air, sunny sky, top five type day as we clear the sky now. 68, calm wind. The dew point in the 60s, but that will be dropping. So we're going to end up in the upper 50s to near 60 uh, and then near 80. Pick of the week tomorrow. Late storms Thursday into Friday, but again, not all day. Uh, it will become more humid again, but uh, the humidity will drop by late Friday. So that should set the stage for a pretty good looking weekend. Could be a few lingering showers Saturday. Comfortable 76. Lots of sun. Warm, but not too humid. Sunday 82. It does turn warmer and uh, uh, a little more humid as we go into early next week with some showers and storms by Tuesday. That's a check of your forecast. Stay right there. Much more Eyewitness News coming up right after this. Don't go away. Yeah, check, one, two, three, check, check. Good evening, I'm Brendan Miller with Eyewitness Sports. We're doing football. The Superman thing. You're not wearing blue. Yeah, I'm not wearing blue. <laughs> Thanks.
It's time for Eyewitness Sports. Good evening, I'm Brendan Miller with Eyewitness Sports. The high school football season, and with that, the 2023 fall high school sports season is underway as of yesterday, at least unofficially. The start of the year for high school football players in the Mohawk Valley is marked by the yearly tradition of the Utica University High School Football Camp. The camp, which is hosted by the Pioneers every July, is a way for players and coaches from around the area to see their teams stack up against other local squads and to see who among their own players rises to the top. Last year, the camp saw 10 teams and hundreds of players all competing in their uppers or helmets and shoulder pads, allowing for light contact and the simulation of real games. Tonight is the second night, running from 6 to 9 o'clock, each day ending with the best offense and defense of the day going head-to-head -head in a goal line scenario while the other squads surround the playing area and shout words of, let's call it, encouragement. Also under the lights tonight, the New York State Legion Baseball District 5 tournament was supposed to be underway at Murnane Field, but instead was moved to Deludis Field in Rome. But regardless, the victor of one of tonight's contests will find themselves in the District 5 championship game. The eight-team double elimination tournament had already been through its first two days. And the story right now, the underdog, Adrian Post, who was a five-seed defeated fourth-seeded Moran Post and were able to get past top-seeded Smith in the second round by a single run. They're playing in the nightcap of the winner's side of the bracket tonight against the other yet-to-be-beaten squad, Utica Post. Utica with a pair of wins, one against the higher-seeded team as the three-seed they defeated New Hartford, the sixth in the first round, and then the second-seeded Whitestown Post team in the second. That game is yet to finish. It actually started at 8.30 with the movement of fields, so a little bit later starts for both of these games. The winner there has the advantage going into the championship. Meanwhile, on the side of the bracket that contains teams with already one loss, Whitestown and Moran started their game at 6 o'clock. They were supposed to play yesterday, but due to air quality, had the contest postponed to tonight. And the winner, Whitestown, will go against Smith Post, who were able to play last night and eliminated New Hartford by a score of 4-3 to three in the quarterfinals. For now, that's all for sports. Check out SeamLineHomePage.com for your top sports stories. It's more Eyewitness News coming up right after the break. Eyewitness News First at 10 continues. In a social media tirade, former President Trump said he received notice he's a target of a federal grand jury probing his actions leading up to the Capitol riot on January 6th. 
It's a sign as the investigation winds down, more charges could be against him. Fox News correspondent Caroline Shively reports from Washington. Former President Donald Trump is entangled with the law yet again. After just last month pleading not guilty to federal charges related to his handling of classified documents, now another indictment could be coming down the pike. Special counsel Jack Smith sent a letter to Trump Sunday informing him he is the target of a criminal investigation looking at efforts to overturn the 2020 election. These letters often uh, tell the target that they need to preserve evidence, that they need to look at counsel, and that they have a set period of time where they can appear before the grand jury. And charges could be next. Investigators have been eyeing obstruction, looking at Trump's actions leading up to the Capitol riot. It would be his third criminal indictment in months, but Republicans say the timing is not accidental. If you notice recently, President Trump went up in the polls and was uh, actually surpassing President Biden for re-election. So what do they do now? Weaponize government to go after their number one opponent. Mr. Trump's legal woes are sucking all the oxygen out of the GOP primary. But politically, it might be what the front runner needs. Each of these indictments seems to give him a boost in the polls. The White House is declining to comment on the case. Other Democrats say they weren't surprised. And I expect uh, Donald Trump to be indicted in the near future. We also expect state charges to come very soon related to Trump's actions to overturn election results in Georgia. In Washington, Caroline Shively, Fox News. We'll close out the broadcast when we return. It's New York Lottery's numbers, win four, and take five drawings for Tuesday evening, July 18th, 2023. Being observed by KPMG. I'm Felicia Ramos Peters. Now here's the nice number. First ball up is two. The next is six. And the last is three. Make tonight's number two, six, three. Tomorrow's Powerball jackpot is one billion dollars. And now win four. First ball up. It's seven, the next is two, the next is two, and the last is eight. Make tonight's win for number seven, two, two, eight. Now it's time for tonight's take five drawing. Last night we had over 3,000 take five cash winners. Tonight's winning take five numbers are 22, 36, 25, 11 and 7. Thank you for joining us and have a fantastic night.
Eyewitness News First at 10 continues. All right, welcome back. Uh, let's get you up to date with the forecast. Beautiful day tomorrow. Uh, sunshine, low humidity, the smoke is gone. Temperature right around 80, uh, which is pretty close to where it should be. It will turn warmer and more humid again by Thursday with some late day showers and storms into Friday as well, but not all day rain. Uh, and it will become less humid by late in the day Friday, setting us up for a pretty nice weekend. Could be a lingering shower Saturday, not going to ruin the day. The sky clears late, 76. Lots of sun, warm but not humid. Sunday, 82. Does turn a little toasty as we get into Monday. Highs in the mid-80s with a few storms by Tuesday. Shelby, over to you. All right, thanks, Craig. Sounds like it's going to be a great week. And thank you for joining us tonight for Eyewitness News. First at 10, we'll see you back here again tomorrow.